How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning is playing, we're looking at The Wretched, where a teenage boy struggling with his parents' imminent divorce faces off with an old witch who has possessed the neighbor next door. This opened in drive-ins back in May this year and cleaned up, staying at number one at the box office for several weeks. Uh, of course, there was also no real competition of any kind, but a drive-in is a perfect kind of vehicle for this movie because it honestly feels like a throwback in a sense and reminded me of horror films from the early 2000s in a good way. It is pretty straightforward and not exactly mind-blowing, and the story is a little clunky at points, but it is a solid and fun experience, chock full of plenty of jump scares and peppered with some quite nice gore and practical effects. I also like their particular unique take on a witch creature, appropriately called the Wretch, and this is probably the highlight overall. It actually also has some interesting elements introduced behind how she works. So let's check out the Wretched, breaking down the story, just what the Wretch is all about and her particular characteristics, as well as explaining the twist ending that informs us that things aren't quite over after all. Understanding this evil must have been around for quite some time, we opened 35 years ago in a forested area, strewn with children's belongings like crayons, a stuffed bunny, and a Rubik's Cube. Gotta be the 80s, no one plays with those things anymore. A babysitter comes to a house, getting no answer at the door. She finds no sign of anyone inside, as well as the phone off the hook. She calls her mom, informing her that she's babysitting tonight, and no, isn't hanging out with her boyfriend Mark. I promise, Ma. Hearing noises coming from the basement, at the bottom of the stairs is a porcelain doll at her feet, and she finds a family photo with the father's eyes scratched out. Venturing deeper, there's some distinct chewing noises heard, seeing a woman hunched over and eating what must be her daughter. You, that's an opener right there. She turns to face her, covered in blood, and snarls. She then sees the husband at the top of the stairs, who slams the door on her, seeing a marking of a triangle with longer lines at the top resembling horns. This establishes what to expect with this creature, known as the Wretch. Then we jump to the present day, teenager Ben having a nightmare of being drowned and is shocked awake on a bus. An older woman compliments him on the penmanship on his cast, Ben, written on it. Who writes their own name on their cast? That's kind of odd. He's going to visit his dad for the summer, residing in a small lakefront town, piecing together that his parents have split recently. Liam is busy making his world-famous chili dogs while Ben fiddles with his outdated TV. Where the HDMI port? at Pops! On the fridge, there's a photo of the family which has been folded over. Under the fold, unsurprisingly, is his mom, as though his father is already trying to forget about the past. But you can't just forget about someone forever, right? At dinner, Liam is loving the country life, the sounds of the forest and crickets like music to his ears. He has a present for his son, a rusty ass old bike, him scoffing that he has his license now, and besides, mom is giving her her old car anyway. Dad wants to know how he broke his arm, but Ben isn't willing to discuss it, muttering not now. Later down at the marina, his dad has scored him a job, which already proves difficult thanks to some morons first catching the eye of some lovely lasses. Their boy companions are lugging a grill to use on the boat. Yeah, that's not a great idea. He informs them this is not allowed, which they cleverly respond with by calling him a dumbass and flipping him off. Impressive, boys. He meets another employee, Mallory, who is chuffed about nepotism landing him the job, asking if she would have gotten the job with a broken arm too. Probably not. She offers him a starburst and to taste the rainbow. Him correcting her, that's uh, actually Skittles, candy tagline expert over here. And across the way, he sees his dad smooching with a woman, Sarah, to Ben's confusion. Looks like Pops is already moving on. While Ben's summer starts on a pretty typical note, it's their neighbors that have the most supernatural hullabaloo to deal with. Mother Abby and her son Dylan taking a walk through the woods. He thinks they're lost, but she's confident she knows exactly where they are. When she goes to take a leak, she loses sight of the boy who encounters the wretch in her home, a tree marked by the same symbol, and hears an echoey voice that resembles his mother's coming from a cavernous hole at the base of the tree, beckoning him to come closer. Stay away from the death tree. A gnarled white hand reaches out, and luckily his mom finds him. And strangely, when looking back, the tree has vanished. They return home with quite a surprise for Father Ty, a buck carcass, explaining that they hid it on the way home. And hey, no sense in wasting good meat, right? Abby intending to gut it and clean it. Also intending to teach the kids that meat doesn't just come in plastic packaging. Getting beer holding assistance from her son, she gets to carving and accidentally spills its guts. Dylan mumbling he thinks she did 
it wrong. Night falls and Ben hangs out outside doing his best to play guitar with his broken arm and decides to go over and spy on the neighbors, seeing them about to get busy in the window. But they are interrupted by their baby crying. Sometime later at the truck, a bunch of meat juice pours to the ground, the wind blows the tarp off and see that the wretch has transported herself inside the buck's body, catching a glimpse of her in the animal's eye as she walks away. Ben is awoken later by some odd noises, what sounds like footsteps on the floorboards above, and grabs a flashlight to look around outside. The sounds continue, sending him next door, noticing some lattice has been broken, exposing a crawl space under the house, discovering a raccoon down there. Oh, phew, I was worried it was something else. The wretch then appears behind him, donned in a skull mask, and just about to see it, Ty flips the floodlights on, obscuring his vision and misses the creature, limply telling Ty that he thought he saw an animal. The next morning, Dylan is fiddling with the hole and Ben warns him to stay away. On the way to work, the topic turns to the woman that he saw his dad smooching and feels that he should meet her, them deciding to do it tonight. In the marina office, he meets Mallory's younger sister, Lily, awkwardly telling Ben he's not that cute. Ooh, her sis must have a little crush. Back in the neighbors, Abby is taking care of the baby, noticing that all the plants in the radius around the crawl space are black and dead. She peers inside, picking up a weird smell, assuming that it must mean the baby needs changing, walking off as more flowers die in an instant. I don't think it's the baby's poo-poos. To prepare for dinner, Liam sends Ben to get some dinner rolls, telling him to make sure that they're gluten-free. Yeah, I doubt the general store around here is gonna have that, Dad. It's not like there's a freaking Whole Foods around here or something. Ridiculous. You get gluten and you like it, lady. Mallory shows up, inviting him to a party, and he turns her down initially, but then changes his mind, joining her and some other kids to party down. It's a powder keg of drinks and red cups and hormone-fueled makeout sessions, even playing a game of the classic Never Have I Ever. One girl does a a pretty easy one, as she's never broken an arm, meaning Ben has to take a drink. Mel says that he doesn't have to, but he downs it like a champ while the others cheer him on. Over the course of the evening, they obviously get a lot more drunk, Mal and Ben now alone, and she asks how he broke his arm. He divulges that he fell out of a neighbor's second story window, having snuck in to steal Vicodin, both laughing and agreeing that it was pretty stupid. And she divulges her most embarrassing memory. Inspired by Hannah Montana, she made her own persona, Dakota Star Crush, and would even wear an orange wig to school and everything. The moment is set for a romantic kiss, but the alcohol takes control. Him tossing his cookies right before they lock lips. Woo, smooth moves, Benny. Having ditched his dad for dinner, he sees he has 10 missed calls from him. And the other girl that he was eyeing earlier at the marina decides to go for a dip and invites him to join in. Asking him to close his eyes, she steals his underwear and flees. The rest of the gang, including Mallory showing up, looks like you got pranked. And he also looks like a real dick now to Mal as well. At the neighbor's house, it's dark and quiet until the baby starts crying. Mom wrestling to her feet to check on them, but everything seems all right. Getting back in bed, she checks the baby monitor. Yep, looking good. Well, that is, except for the menacing black figure at the edge of the crib. She doesn't notice, falling back to sleep, and later a frightened Dylan comes in complaining of odd sounds and joins them in bed. Checking the monitor again, she sees the angle has changed. She goes to see what happened, a toy coming to life and barrels past her. In the baby's room, she closes the window and looks into the crib, curiously only seeing a blanket. She pulls it away, revealing a bundle of sticks underneath. The baby is gone! A pool of liquid starts forming at her feet, and hands grab her, dragging her under the crib, then hearing some munching sounds. Yuh-oh. When Ben finally comes home, he sees her oddly walking off into the woods and vanishes into the darkness. Liam comes out irritated that he's been missing all night, and things get heated, telling him he's not going to apologize to some bitch he's sleeping with. Awkwardly, right at this moment, Sarah enters. Ooh, uh, sorry, I meant the other lady he's sleeping with. Uh, wait. That's not better. Right, dang. Dang, Ben is really blowing this whole evening at every single step. In the morning, Ty wakes up to his cell phone ringing, his wife not in bed. While downstairs, Dylan is watching some cartoons eating cereal, a pair of legs descending down the stairs towards him. Ty is clueless in the shower, and he must be quite distracted, not noticing her oddly standing there motionless, planting a kiss on her cheek, chuckling, <laughs> someone needs to take a shower, and leaving. Things are still a bit tense at the marina. When seeing Mal, he gives a wave, but she averts 
diverts her attention and walks on without looking back. The other gang show up and make fun of his tiny dick, and in retaliation, Ben dumps a can of trash in their boat. Abby does take a shower as suggested, but it's clear that a scrub isn't going to fix what's wrong with her, hearing her bones cracking and a rash starting to form on her back. Well, yeah, something's definitely wrong with mom, which is made even more obvious when Dylan comes into the room worried about a missing rabbit, finding her naked standing at the window. And she starts to move in a very unnatural way, her bones cracking continuously, sending Dylan fleeing in terror. Another day at the marina in the can, dad has some more work to do, and rather than waiting, Ben asks Sarah to give him a lift, and she kindly does so even after him being a jerk last night. They do clear the air, and she extends another chance to him, just as long as he agrees to try her killer vegan cooking. Making it back home, he hears footsteps upstairs and grabs a golf club, slowly making his way up. Creaking a door open, he discovers a shaken Dylan in the corner. His mom arrives, calling up for him to come out, the boy begging him to not let her in. In an eerily calm voice, she asks if her son is here, and he covers for him saying, nope, just us. Wait, us? Hmm, shouldn't he be alone? Yet she doesn't correct him, and we'll find out why that is near the end. She tries to bust in the door, him barking that this is private property, which aggravates her, gravely threatening he's going to snap that other arm of his. Ty shows up, breaking the tension, and hearing his dad's voice, Dylan comes rushing down the stairs to him, Abby staring daggers at Ben before they leave. Dad is still working at the harbor, and he's startled by Mallory, who finds an unexpected apology in her backpack. Handfuls of her favorite Starburst flavors from Ben. While he's busy playing spy still with the neighbors, watching them through binoculars and waiting for anything to happen. Mallory calls, thanking him for his apology, but he's a bit preoccupied. The couple again prepare for some sexy times, but she seems a lot more aggressive now, passionately making out and wrapping her legs around him. She rides on top of him, seeing these strange sores on her back have spread, pushing his hand away when he almost touches them. Phew, that was close. There's nothing else odd about my behavior whatsoever, so don't touch the stuff on my back, because that would be a dead giveaway. But it doesn't sound like things were so normal at the neighbors after all. The next morning, Mal kicks Ben awake, him asking where Dylan is, as he was supposed to be here for a lesson at 10. Well, she shrugs it off as this kind of thing happening all the time. But he knows better rushing off to his house. When asking Ty, he curiously says he doesn't have a son, thinking he must be messing with him. It even declares that he has no kids, which is obviously not the case. Abby nearby looming behind a corner. Ben flips over the doormat, exposing the same wretch symbol underneath, meaning the house has been marked as hers. He snaps a photo and cross-checks it via a Google image search. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Is it possible for a modern horror movie to not have a Google research scene in it? If it is, I don't want to know about it. At least he used the image thing and didn't just like Google bad lady could disappear or whatever. Brings up a ton of results, including an old drawing. This wretch must have been around for a long ass time, even more than 35 years. Seen stepping into someone's body, just as with Abby, and learns that it feasts on the forgotten. Well, there you go. She makes family members forget the other members and then eats them. Sounds like a foolproof plan, lady. It must have been working for thousands of years or whatever, so you can't really argue with that. Mal joins him in some spy games. Ben busy putting a salt barrier around the house for protection. Then Abby comes out of the cellar carrying a garbage bag. Mal joking, wonder how many dead babies she's got down there. She thinks that he's acting a bit nuts, especially so when noticing he's been looking at Witchipedia. Is that a real website? I hope so. He brings up his confusion of Ty saying he didn't have a kid when he clearly does, remembering how terrified Dylan was of his own mom. She boldly suggests just going over and knocking on the door and asking, and leaves to lock up the marina office. But along the way, to his horror, decides to leave a note under Abby's door, texting him that she poked the bear. Ben looks up to the second floor, Abby there staring intently at him. Yeah, probably best not to poke a bear, but what do I know? It's Ty that finds the note, about to investigate the basement himself, but Abby stops him asking if he wants a beer. He's starting to think something might be up here, asking if she's seen any kids messing with the cellar door, which she puts a quick stop to, whispering a weird language into his ear. And instantly his face goes blank, even dropping his beer. A trickle of blood pours out, him looking quite dazed, like she just drained his brain, making him forget, as we know. At the office, Abby appears at the door, but Sarah doesn't notice, followed by Mal barging in, saying that she'll lock up. She hears another door squeaking open, but doesn't see anything, although we 
we notice that on the photo collage board nearby, the one photo of her family is now missing. Looking like poking the bear only pissed it off, which is about what you'd expect. And now Abby, via the wretch, has also turned her attention to Mal's family. Meanwhile, Ben digs through the garbage can, discovering a photo of the baby smashed, along with the monitor and other evidence of her existence. Ty stumbles out and looking way out of it, sets to mowing the lawn. Abby in the shower, her back is looking much more effed up now, her skin starting to wrinkle and peel. She pulls on her eyelid, trying to get it back into shape, and yanks a loose tooth out of her mouth, as though her body is rapidly deteriorating. Looks like the wretch is gonna need herself a new host body sooner rather than later. Abby kindly returns the drawing Mal left under the door and walks off, Ben locking himself in his room until she's gone. She again leaves the cellar, locking it up, and he takes advantage of the opportunity to finally scope it out for himself. He procures some mold cutters and cracks the lock, descending down into the basement. There he finds an effigy of sorts, a bunch of bundles of sticks in formation with the symbol on top, a photo of the family hung amongst the wood. And just as in the beginning sequence, dad's face is scratched out. Ben frantically calls 911 to report a missing person, but stops himself, seeing something else. Finding the photo of Mal, both her and her mom's eyes scratched out. To his terror, he calls her, informing her that the wretch is after her sister, but she's already gotten to her, Mal cluelessly asking, who's Lily? And hey, looks like he's getting some use out of that old bike after all. Thanks, dad. He rushes to the marina, finding Lily and Mal at the playground, but she's confused. Lily goes down the slide, and Abby is there waiting down at the bottom for her, about to chase after the jerk guy's return, seeing Abby taking Lily into the woods. And he gets stopped in his tracks for ruining his dad's boat, the kid's kicking the crap out of him. He's able to wrestle himself loose and runs after them into the forest, soon hearing her screaming, and eventually arrives at the wretch's tree. Lily reaches an arm out, hearing snarling. He tries to pull her out, but they yank back hard, sending him flying back and knocking him unconscious on a rock. Him only coming to later that night and the tree is gone. Going back home, he's in hot water again for disappearing, but also for breaking into the neighbor's house. The cops there along with the bolt cutters on the table. His dad accuses him of being on something and Ben does his best to explain what's really going on to no avail. Yowling, it's done. He's going back home with his mother where they intend on putting him in a clinic to get some help. Liam is pulled away by the officers and Ben bumps into Sarah, reassuring him he knows his dad loves him, right? He scoffs, yeah, but he doesn't believe me. Her saying he has to earn that, but realizes then that she overstepped and apologizes saying that's not her place. She goes on that she cares about his dad a lot and is sorry if she had anything to do with this mess. He then comes to a startling revelation when Sarah pours some coffee, the flowers at the window starting to die. Her whispering she likes this house, understanding the wretch has moved on to Sarah's body. He throws a salt shaker but misses, the room turning dark, her skin turning weird and veiny. She shrieks and lunges at him, getting her in the arm with a kitchen knife and suddenly things are back to normal, just in time for Liam to come in wondering what the hell he did. This causes him to get arrested, still pleading with his dad that that's not really Sarah and to look in the basement, him brushing it off as him just being high. Looking to the ambulance, Sarah whispers in the paramedic's ear, knowing for sure that the wretch has her. Liam tries to leave, but Sarah keeps stopping him, saying she could use a drink. Liam dutifully pours some wine, and he tries to leave again. She grabs his arm, trying to seduce him, but he rebuffs her and leaves anyway. The clearly influenced cop drags Ben out to the middle of nowhere at the shore of the lake, spotting telltale blood pouring from his ear. He yanks him out of the car, plunging his face into the water, just like his dream at the beginning on the bus. A random dog appears and comes to his rescue, biting the cop's arm. He then turns the gun on Ben, pleading for his life, but the officer instead turns the gun on himself, blowing his brains out. Liam does at least go to check the basement, spotting Ty sulking back towards the shed, and makes his way to the attic, finding Abby's empty body and Ty hanging from the rafters to his dismay. Well, it looks like Ben wasn't lying after all, Pops. He finds the display of branches and candles, first of Ty's family and then his own family's picture. All the faces scratched out. Sarah surprises him from behind with a knife, now donned in the skull mask, knocking over the candles and starting a fire. He painfully makes his way down the stairs, Sarah following not too far behind. He gets her with a shovel, knocking her head all the way around, but she snaps it easily back into place, seeing bizarre movement under her skin. She grabs him and strangles him, hearing his bones crunching. The wretch's real hand emerges from underneath her meat suit, going for his face. Ben appears, shooting her several times and subduing the wretch for the moment. He flees with his dad as the wretch pulls itself out of Sarah's body, screeching as they make it to the truck. Pretty Nardog looking effects, probably the best effect in the movie. The fire continuing to spread through the house. Taking a moment of consideration, he looks down at his cast, curiously seeing 
Nathan written on his arm. Flashing back to back on the bus, a kid now there riding on his cast. Now realizing that just like the others, the wretch has erased Ben's brother Nathan from his memory. And again, the first time I watched this, I was like, what kind of nerd writes their own name on their cast? And as we replay through several previous scenes, like the first dinner or when Abby came looking for Dylan, each time the forgotten Nathan was there too. Also explaining Ben's just us comment that I mentioned earlier. He was there with his brother. His memories about Nathan flooding back, he hears a child scream in their house and goes to save his forgotten bro. Approaching his room marked Nathan's lair. There's only a broken window left behind. Again, hearing him screaming coming from outside. Mal then appears asking where her sister is and gets her to tag along, running into the foreboding woods, following the cries for help all the way to the wretch's tree lair. He pours gasoline all around it and asks her to put down a salt barrier as well, throwing a rope down into the hole. Mal has no idea what's going on, informing her that she took Lily and her brother, then climbing down into the hole. Pointing his flashlight around the darkness, he spots Kid's toys and hearing a distant screech leads him to another tunnel. On the other side, finding Nathan bound up in branches and whatnot. Pulling away the debris, he tells him to run, promising that he'll be right behind. Hearing growling, the wretch is there, bones crunching as usual, in the middle of feeding on a boy, grabbing it and slinking away. Ben finds a gun and chases after, seeing her in the light, and she attacks, knocking the flashlight out of the way. He yells for Nathan to go and pulls up his shirt, sees he's been injured. He pushes Nathan up to the surface, Mal getting him the rest of the way. Just about to climb out himself, he hears Lily and heroically goes back for her. He finds her as well and gets to work removing her from her branch prison, the wretch rising out of the water behind him. She goes for his feet, knocking him on his back and crawls up his body. Lily snaps a Polaroid, the light overwhelming her and Ben gets her in the neck with a bone. Rushing back to the entrance, both get out with the wretch right behind. She tugs on Ben, trying to drag him back down, hearing a car horn honking. It's Liam! Mal throws salt in the wretch's face, allowing them to get out of the way just in the nick of time as dad smashes into her and her precious evil tree. We abruptly move on to some time later, and it seems like everything turned out a-okay. Mal talks to a counselor, telling them that Lily is getting better, and they have a question for her about something that her sister said, about needing to burn the tree? Wondering what tree? We then go back to that night, them shouldering dad to get away, but she stops looking back to the tree. Now smiling, saying it just sounds like one of her nightmares. At the harbor office, it's overloaded with get well flower bouquets, and she grabs one, putting it in her ear, about to help some kids to go out and do some fishing. Ben yells out, calling her by her stage name, Star Crush, and he's heading home, seeing the whole fam is back together, but he clarifies that it's just that mom is driving him back. She wistfully tells him, good luck with everything, God, y'all just kiss already, and they go in for an awkward hug, her giving him the flower, saying it's from Lily, and he goes in for the big kiss, finally, telling her that's from them. Smooth, bro. Extra smooth. You, you learned some lessons, I can tell. You're a man now. She chuckles, asking to not forget her, returning to the kids. The family all loaded up. Mom says she's pretty, making fun of Liam for being a wuss about his pain. I mean, he got stabbed. Give him a little slack there, lady. Ben smells the flower and realizes it's fake, turning back and thinking, hmm, I wonder what that means. Out on the water, Mal is with the kids, eerily staring off into space. While it does feel like there's maybe a step or two missing here, it's heavily implied that the wretch wasn't defeated and has now moved on to Mallory. They bring up the specifics of needing to burn the tree down, but we don't actually see that happen. So they must have just bounced and didn't actually set it on fire. Big mistake, obviously, as now the wretch can continue its never ending quest to feast on people and steal their bodies. Way to go, gang. At least Ben and his family got out of there and, you know, probably won't be going back to the lake anytime soon. And perhaps they maybe have at least have successfully evaded her grasp. So that's something, I guess. With that, we have reached the conclusion of this inning explained on The Wretched. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflakes. What did you guys think of The Wretched and its ending? What's your favorite witch movie? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflakes. See you next time.